Alrighty, so as Russ noted earlier, our technical topic for this evening is smart objects. First, Dave Thaler is going to kind of give an overview and highlight some of the architectural considerations that came out of the IAB work. And then Hannes is going to talk about some of the security and privacy considerations around smart objects. And then we'll open the floor for about 15 minutes of Q&A. Okay, so a few years ago, the IAB observed that there were a number of smart objects being deployed, developed, uh, that did not have IP in them. And so we said, what should we do about this? So we organized this workshop a couple years ago that resulted in the RFC that's on the screen there. Um, that RFC made a couple of recommendations. One of those recommendations was specifically for the IAB. It was that the IAB develop architectural guidelines about how to use existing protocols. Okay? And it also made some recommendations for the IETF to address. Uh, there was also this belief in the industry that IP just was too big to fit on these smart objects. And so that was part of the workshop in the RFC as well. And so we, the IAB, wanted a document that would describe when and why it was appropriate to put uh, IP into smart objects. And so this RFC that just came out this last week is the result of that, a couple years of effort. And thank you to many of you in the IETF that sent us great comments and helped us to improve that because the audience of that document is not you all per se, it's the smart object engineers. Right? This talk is tailored to you and to, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that are in the document and kind of what's left for us to think about. So while the IAB was working on, the, on their part of the recommendations from the workshop, right, the, IE, the IETF and other organizations were also working. There's been, I don't know, at least seven or so different working groups in the IETF that have been chartered, made great progress, and so forth. The IRTF just met uh, as had a proposed research group. right? That's kind of the IRTF equivalent of a BOF that met this last weekend. The Elwig working group has an RFC that's the one that's on the slide there that has terminology for constrained nodes. And this talks about smart objects that go all the way down to having much less than, say, 10K memory and 100K code. Meanwhile, outside the IETF, various other organizations were busy. Right? We had things like the Zigbee Alliance that created the Zigbee IP uh, profile that then adopted IETF technologies. We had the Bluetooth SIG and IETF working closely together on IPv6 over Bluetooth Smart, or BTLE. And you had a plethora of IP-based alliances that were either formed or expanded, and a bunch of them are listed there in alphabetical order. And meanwhile, the hackers themselves were also working over time. So we've had all kinds of different um, headlines that you may have seen over the past two years or so. Right? We've had attacks against televisions. We've had hacks against thermostats. We've had hacks against light bulbs. Um, we've had hacks against front door locks and power outlets, even certain toilets. Right? It says, uh, hacking a smart toilet is either a neat trick or a mean prank. Right. That same article then goes on to talk about taking over the hubs that may control all of the home automation. And the hackers did some very creepy things with a toy bunny. So what's so special about a smart object anyway? Well, there's at least four different things. There's not one thing that's a smart object. Or when we say Internet of Things, it means many different things. There's at least four different criteria that you might say apply to different types of smart objects. Right? Maybe it's very constrained in some way. It doesn't have very much memory or bandwidth or what have you. Maybe it interacts directly with the physical world even when a human isn't present. And so in some sense, it may be more dangerous in that respect. It might be physically accessible by untrusted parties and therefore very hard to secure. Or it might be physically inaccessible by trusted parties and be very hard to service. So a particular smart object may have any one of those criteria and maybe more. So when we talk about smart objects, right, there's a big space with lots of different things going on. So when we in the IAB looked at smart object architecture, we looked at sort of three categories of architecture, right? Starting from the bottom, there's decisions that our smart object engineers make around hardware, right? Which type of radio is in there? What's the radio technology? Is it on battery or is it powered? Things like that, okay? On top of that, they make decisions based on software stack, right? Is it this software? Which protocols are, are, are in there? Which protocols are implemented and so forth? And on top of that, you have information or data models that say, what's the schemas for these different things? Like, what is a thermostat? What does it expose? That type of thing. Historically, the IETF typically focuses only on the middle layer. Okay? 
Now, of course, in the IAB, we think about things wider than just the IETF. We think about the things that the IETF and its relationship to many other organizations. So that's kind of our job is to look at the big picture, point out gaps, and facilitate relationships between organizations. When the smart objects get connected to the internet, things get a little bit more complex, okay, which is you have to deal with the internet protocols. You may have to deal with corresponding attacks against those protocols. And there may be additional privacy issues, for example, multiple jurisdictions, right? If you have a smart object that's not connected to anything else, maybe the only jurisdiction you care about is the one it's physically present in, right? But once that thing is communicating across the internet, the communication itself may span multiple jurisdictions and therefore may have additional legal issues to deal with. So this is kind of the one slide version of, uh, of what the IAB was asked to do in that workshop, which is, you know, to summarize, there's still trade-offs of putting IP in smart objects, right? You see the stack on the left and the stack on the right. If you do put IP into a smart object, you have the left stack, and this means you have to devote, you, the smart object engineer, have to devote some resources to TCP IP, where that same resources, silicon or what have you, could have been devoted to something else that that device might be able to do. And you have to worry about potentially securing IP from outside the local network. If, on the other hand, you don't put IP in there, okay, then you usually need some application layer gateway in order to actually accomplish the rest of your scenario. And that can be a deployment burden. Second example is you might end up reinventing things the IETF already did, congestion control, security, reliability, and so forth. And so you see the app box on the right is a little bit taller than the app box on the left because it includes part of the things that are classically inside TCP IP. And finally, and perhaps uh, often the most important, is you can't leverage the large ecosystem of IP-based knowledge, tools, personnel, training, operational experience, and so forth, the economies of scale that you get from using IP. So this is the inherent trade-off that they have to make, is to say which one of these things is, is more dominant in their case. As we went through this exercise, we identified four common communication patterns, and these are the same communication patterns that show up in some other working groups and things, that we evaluated what's the architectural impact of. So I'll walk through each of these. The first one is the device-to-device -device pattern. Okay? That means you have a smart object that's either talking to another smart object, or talking to another device that's not a smart object, but there's a local network in the middle where that could be IP or it could be non-IP, right? That could be Bluetooth or Zigbee or what have you in the middle. And the trust and security and such things are as deployed today, typically um, based on direct relationships between those two. Sometimes the term pairing is used. Now, if you look at what's actually sold on the market today, most of those things today don't use IP. Okay, they said they directly, so it's the picture on the right of the previous slide. Bluetooth, Zigbee, Z-Wave, and so on. Each of those have a, have a forum that takes care of standardizing how to do application or device-specific schemas over that particular layer two protocol. And so as a result, today when we look around at what the current state of affairs is, we have many different organizations that are trying to define data models for different types of smart objects. So how many models of a light bulb or a thermostat are there? There's a bunch of them across the industry right now. That's just the current state of things. There's no common um, information model. So here's an example of a bunch of devices that fit into that category. Okay. Second pattern is the device to cloud pattern, right? So in this case, the smart object connects to the existing network and connects back to a cloud service that's typically run by the same vendor as, as sells the smart object. Okay. The benefit, of course, of this, the reason why they do it is so that you can access that device or data from anywhere, right? You just talk to the cloud service and you get access to it. But the smart object is constrained in this choice of layer two media because it can only depend on what's already ubiquitously deployed in the environments that it's being sold for. So in many cases, such as in the consumer market, this means it's Wi-Fi. Okay? Now, even with Wi-Fi, the question is, how do you get it on the Wi-Fi network to begin with? Right? You've got to get the keys into the thing to get it on the Wi-Fi network. Well, the second problem is there's no ubiquitous standard for configuring the smart objects of those keys. So everybody has their own mechanisms. Um, so often from the same vendor, or sorry, often on a per vendor basis, um, and so this whole thing together tends to mean that in this picture today, you see lots of silos, right? This vendor's um, red line, a different vendor's red line, and so on. And so what happens here, one of the concerns is that the device object, if that cloud provider ever goes away, goes out of business, or sometimes even changes hosting provider, that smart object can become unusable if it can no longer connect back to the cloud service it's expecting, okay? And so we point out in the document that's tailored to smart object engineers that, you know, there's ways to mitigate that by saying using standard protocols, IP-based, and or using open source. 
So here's some examples of devices on the market today that fit into this category. And the top left one, Little Printer, is interesting because this cloud service is actually shutting down this particular month. And so it's an example of that case at the bottom of the last slide. They've chosen to say they're going to outsource, sorry, to open source their implementation to allow somebody else to do cloud services. So they've already had to go through this. The third pattern is one that kind of takes the other two and puts them together. So the red line there is saying the smart object talks to some application layer gateway. It does this so that that application gate layer gateway can then facilitate communication off to the cloud, such as in the device to cloud model, or to a different local area network, which is the bottom dash line. So this is commonly used whenever there's L2 media that's not ubiquitously deployed, say when the red line is going across 802.15.4, or say in an uh, enterprise environment where you need some custom authentication mechanism that's there, or when you want interoperability with, not, with legacy non-IP devices, right, between two different local networks there at the bottom. Okay, so here, often the smart object and the ALG are from the same vendor. And of course, one of the common models is where the ALG is just an app inside of a smartphone. Now, it's worth pointing out, because we like to look for IPv6 in places, that having an ALG, actually, no, there's problems with ALGs, but one of the benefits here is that this does allow IPv6-only devices to access things that aren't IPv6-capable, whether they're non-IP or they're legacy v4-only cloud services or legacy uh, IPv4-only devices. So one of the main points we tried to make in the document was those ALGs, right, we want them to be more generic and not vendor-specific, to work in more classes of devices. Okay. So our point was that more cheaper and reliable ones are going to be more likely if the devices use standard protocols that don't require an ALG. Okay. Well, that only goes so far because one of the problems that we have today goes back to the choice of data models and schemas, right? Even if the protocols are standard, right, if the schemas aren't the same, you still need an ALG to map the schema, okay? So we can't, in our ITF, at least right now, we can't completely solve the problem, but we can give advice and point out what the gap is and facilitate relationships. So here's an example of some things on the market that are sold as the ALGs in this picture. And here's an example of some things that are sold as smart objects that use an app on a smartphone as the ALG. Okay, so the point is that all of these models are actually widely used in uh, various markets today. And here we pick most of our examples from consumer markets, but the same thing happens in other cases. The fourth model is a little bit different in, in that it goes together with one of the previous ones, typically the cloud to device one. And this is where you have different silos from different vendors. But you have scenarios where you need information from different silos together to accomplish some particular task. And so because you have proprietary schemas that go back to there, this is where you have two cloud services that either federate or have APIs between them to, to allow things to work together. So for example, RESTful cloud APIs and so forth. So standard protocols, again, help, but aren't sufficient because you need to have standardized information models, or at least common information models, in between two vendors. They're speaking the same schemas, if you will. So here's an example today where you have smart things on the left and you have a drop cam on the right, and you can have a smart things application running on a smartphone that can access the drop cam specifically because the two cloud services provide communication in between each other. So to summarize the observations that we made about the current situation regarding standardization, First issue is that information and data models for various types of smart objects, that there's not a single one that's out there. There's a plethora of them being um, defined right now. However, today, this is mostly outside the scope of the IETF. About the only ones the IETF focuses on are data models specifically for connectivity, like what's the model for a router or a switch or a bridge or IP configuration in a device, right? But not for things like thermostats and light bulbs and so forth. There's many other forums in this space uh, with the usual discussions around how you deal with that. But well, that's one of the things we as the IETF uh, look at and point out and facilitate. Second example that I pointed out was how do you get an application onto an L2 network, such as a Wi-Fi network? How do you get a smart object onto that? Well, today, if you look around, there's not a single ubiquitous standard, right? There are some standards, like uh, WPS, for example, that aren't ubiquitously accepted by all types of devices and operating systems and things. So that's about the closest we come to things that are like standards. And so today, you have various proprietary solutions. One common one is just where they put a, a web server into the smart object. And so you connect to that thing as an AP. You configure it with a web page. It drops off. It connects to your regular Wi-Fi network. So that doesn't require a standard protocol. It just requires putting a web server into the little smart object, right? And so there's still some desire for having a common mechanism rather than having every configuration of every device be custom. 
Um, but it's not clear which organization is the best one where it belongs. Is it the Alliance for the L2 technology? Is it the standards, pro standards uh, organization for the L2 technology? Does the IETF have a role? Uh, we're not sure exactly, but certainly as, the I as an IEB looking at the big architecture, it's something that we're looking at. And of course, standardization for most of these, all right, it's just seen as being too slow. So even if something does get standards, things are going to be out there in the meantime. So as the IAB, we're often seen as people who look out for the end-to-end -end model. And so what impacts does this have on the end-to-end -end model? Well, there's two IAB RFCs that are worth calling out here. The first one is 1958, which is the architectural or design principles. It says, among other things, the goal is intelligence is end-to-end -end rather than hidden in the network. Okay. But if we go back to the RFC that I quoted from the Elwig working group, it talks about the tiniest of devices don't have enough to actually serve internet connectivity on their own. So they need some gateway type thing. So what does that mean for the end-to-end -end model? Second example, again an, an IAB RFC. All right, 3724 is a statement specifically on end-to-end -end, um, uh, considerations. And it talks about requiring modification in the network is typically more difficult than modifying endnotes. Okay. That statement is no longer necessarily true, right? Well, it can, for example, it can be really expensive, as Hannes will tell us in a second here, to put a secure software update mechanism in a smart object. It might have a very long lifetime. And so as a result, people put modification on the network because they can't change the end devices if they have a long lifespan. So what does this mean for the end-to-end -end model? These are things that are our job to think about. We're thinking about them. Your input is welcome. Uh, the last slide before I hand off to uh, Hannes is that you know when we talk about cost, right? Often we have to think about the total cost of ownership, which is the sum of at least three things, right? Hardware, energy cost, deployment cost, development cost, sorry, and maybe some other things. And this notion of, gosh, it's too expensive to put something in is focusing just on the hardware cost, right? And sometimes people say, or, you know, uh, organizations that do smart objects try to compete on other things, like you buy our object and we will save you money on your power bill. That's smart, man smart power management. Or... Um, Ma uh, the deployability, right? Management stuff may make the total cost of ownership go down because we do a good job of managing our objects and things. And so this notion of, gosh, it's more expensive to put that into there doesn't have the whole picture in it. Okay? Of course, in many enterprises, right, these may, things may come out of different budget lines, and so it can actually be difficult to um, get across this concept of total ownership or at least get the budgeting to work out. Okay? So all of these factors have to be taken into account. And so with this, I'll hand off to Hanna for the security part of the discussion. Thank you, Dave. So there are different methodologies for actually uh, designing a secure IoT system. And I have described four of them here. And we'll go into the details of uh, two of them only. The first one is, is one that you are probably very much familiar with, because it's a methodology we, we apply often when writing security consideration sections and apply uh, the work that the IEB has done on RFC 3552, um, for that matter. Um, and the last item, the um, following design patterns, is something that uh, Dave has just talked about. And obviously, in taking or learning from those uh, patterns, people also apply the security uh, mechanisms used in those. Um, the IETF, however, has a lot to say also in, in or providing guide, guidance and recommendations in, in the security environment that are also applicable to the IoT context. And uh, furthermore, it's very common to actually look at attacks um, to learn from, from stakes as others did, and I would like to focus on those two. Um, but before I do that, I would like to, um, to highlight that the whole process of developing uh, security solutions is often fairly complicated because there are many different communities involved. And if you look at that picture on the left-hand side, you see the cryptographic community designing principles or primitives like uh, encryption algorithms, hash functions, and so on. Um, standards organization developing protocols and architectures, uh, implementers actually turning those specification into code, and then finally the community who does the deployment. And of course, each of those communities have to fight with their own different uh, unique problems. So implementations, as you, as you know, often deal with buffer overflow vulnerabilities, require all sorts of ex extensive testing and so on, secure coding practices, etc. So understanding this whole sort of distributed nature of the development process is obviously crucial to uh, deal with some of the security problems on the internet and also in, in the same applies to the IoT context. 
Um, as said, the IDF has a lot to contribute in that environment, so I picked a couple of those examples which I think are particularly relevant. Um, there's uh, RFC uh, 4107 uh, focuses on key management and it discusses the relationship uh, between manual and automatic key management and by now we, we all know that uh, solutions should focus on, on automatic key management. I will uh, show you on why this is still relevant in, in context of attacks that we see today. Um, a, recently, a recent publication, RFC 7258, um, talks about pervasive monitoring and recommends to use uh, encryption and, and Russ mentioned the statement uh, early in the, in the plenary. Um, an ongoing effort is, to, uh, is documenting the uh, crypto agility and to allow uh, specifications and, and uh, implementations to actually migrate from one cryptographic algorithm to another one uh, in case there are advances or there are problems with one of those algorithms. And specifically considering the long lifetime of IoT products, we're talking about 10, even sometimes even 20 years, that's obviously an, an aspect to, uh, to think about. Um, there are randomness requirements and key, len key lens recommendations that I'm going to talk about in, a, in the next two slides. But uh, it's also worth pointing out that there, there are two working groups dealing with protocol-specific recommendations that uh, are worthwhile following and looking into, specifically focusing on the use of transport layer security. Um, you, can, you can follow up the links if you don't know the book. Um, so RFC uh, 4086 uh, provides some recommendation requirements and uh, they are very important in, in the context of security protocols because those require randomness in various places, um, such as nonces for key transport, um, for key generation, asymmetric key generation, uh, and also for certain signature schemes. So it's a, uh, a crucial aspect. And in the PC world, um, that's quite easy to, or on server side, it's also very easy to accomplish. Um, or, however, in the embedded space, and an IoT space, that turns out to be complicated because many of the sources of randomness are actually not available. And I'm, I, I list a few examples here. Um, for example, the um, uh, timing, clock timings, the input events um, like mouse movements, keyboard movements, uh, keyboard clicks, uh, disk access timings, IRQ timings, and so on, are not available. So what you then find, um, as these two papers, the linked papers, uh, indicate that in the wild you actually see many systems basically uh, having no sources of randomness, generating the same keys over and over again, um, which is obviously fatal for security. Key lens recommendation is another important, or the key lens uh, is another important consideration. Uh, as pointed out by Dave, um, in many of the IoT devices have constraints in terms of CPU, so processing speed, uh, memory, and so on. So the temptation is huge to actually uh, reduce the key size to increase performance. But you can, if you go beyond the, uh, below a certain threshold, obviously the security is worth nothing anymore. Um, there are in the Utah TLS PCP recommends uh, today 112-bit uh, symmetric keys to be used as a, as a standard. And if you look at many of the publications and products, you will see that th those do not meet um, those recommended key sizes. There are the publications who recommend slightly lower key sizes depending on, on the usage and the lifetime of the key, um, but it's worthwhile to keep that in mind. Also for the use of asymmetric algorithms, uh, in the ITF, for many of the specifications, uh, the elliptic curve cryptography is recommended because of the um, shorter key size. Um, jumping over to attacks, I, um, I looked at many different cases and tried to uh, categorize them and to see what attacks we see today, even though um, some of the deployments are still in a, in a, in a very young and early stage. So I, I have uh, five different categories that I think are worthwhile to highlight and, and there are some lessons to learn from. Um, also, uh, what I like to point out is that there's obviously, um, with some of the um, patterns, communication patterns, you have to consider the server side as well, the server side infrastructure. If, if you don't secure the server side, obviously it makes no sense to um, just secure the client side where the, when the IoT devices upload everything to the cloud. Uh, and that's also what uh, the OVASC sec uh, security project recommends in their um, IoT guidelines. Um, so start with the first one, 
Uh, beginning of last year, Bruce Schneier had an interesting article where he points out that many of the IoT devices have no or no convenient software update mechanism, and that's indeed true. Um, so, in in this specific case, um, um, a case from the KUS Communication Congress uh, published last year, end of last year, it was pointed out that. Uh, a software update mechanism uh, using TR69, an implementation found in many routers, but also uh, in, in home routers, but also in, in many Internet of Things appliances who use the same mechanism, um, had a bug. Uh, and that's obviously not uncommon, so it's good to have the, secu the software update mechanism, but uh, that specific one had a bug, a uh, buffer, buffer overflow. And that bug was, the software was shipped in 2002, the bug was um, fixed, or a uh, was fixed in 2005, but unfortunately to the long value chain between sort of the company uh, producing that server and, and um, silicon vendors and, and uh, ISPs and et cetera, these boxes are still vulnerable today. Um, so it's not only uh, important to provide the software update mechanism, but also then to find out on how to distribute the software updates itself. So, and that raised the discussion on whether some of these IoT devices should actually have a sort of a time to live, uh, referring back to uh, the little printer that Dave mentioned uh, earlier. So should these uh, devices die after a certain uh, time or when the vendor uh, decides that it doesn't support it anymore? Also a fairly common is a missing uh, key management. And here's an example from a, a light bulb again. Um, in this case, in, in many of those um, lighting scenarios, you have um, smartphone connecting to it being used to control uh, these lights, and they connect to those using wireless LAN, but then the lights themselves um, use IEEE 802.15.4, uh, a low power radio technology, uh, in a mesh multi hop network. And, and of course, you need a key management solution uh, there to secure the messages, and some of the vendors take shortcuts. Um, and in this specific case, the shortcut was to use the same AES key in all of those products, um, which of course simplifies the key management tremendously. Um, um, up to the point when some researchers came along, extracted the firmware image, and used IDA Pro to uh, disassemble the code and found the, uh, the key. And then obviously, that, um, lacking a firmware update mechanism obviously didn't help either. Um, you may think that these are mistakes uh, only made by small startups who don't have the resources. Um, unfortunately, that's not true. Uh, as the example, a recent example from BMW with their content drive shows because they had the same problem among other problems. Um, uh, another LED uh, light bulb example uh, is this one where that illustrates a missing access control. So in this, in this case, uh, it was reported that uh, hackers had used light bulbs and the uh, missing configuration setting there to turn on and off the lights, uh, which is pretty annoying. Um, <laughs> but, and they used, um, they used a nice program called ZMAP to scan the whole internet to actually find them first, um, which is a very efficient version of NMAP. Uh, doesn't even require an hour to search the whole internet, IPv4 internet. And so you would wonder, like, who would care about light bulbs? Who would want to switch on and off my light bulbs in my, my house? Um, and that's a fair question. Um, however, it turns out that uh, products, other products have the very same vulnerabilities, like cameras, surveillance cameras, baby cameras, uh, gas stations, um, very much the same, uh, the same pattern. And there you can very easily see uh, the problems. And even websites that actually list you, you can conveniently browse through um, surveillance cameras and, and other cameras found on the internet um, to see what people are doing. Um, and if you switch to, uh, to industrial control systems, you very quickly see the potential of um, harm that can be done. And, and I've included uh, uh, an example on where exactly the same problem happened. In, in a publication called Green Lights Forever, some researchers looked at traffic control systems and you see an architecture picture on the right. It illustrates on how these, uh, on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on the roads, how these systems are interconnected wirelessly in, in the different components. And it turns out even also for these uh, systems that the wireless communication is not secured using encryption. The, um, there are default passwords used. Some of them are even hardwired, so you can't even change the default passwords. Um, 
And what I like most with this one, in another uh, publication, uh, researchers extended, expanded that attack and used drones. So they wrote uh, in that paper, even tested the attack launched from a drone flying at over 650 feet, and it worked. Um, and that uh, may give you some, some nice advantages as you, as you go through the city. Um, an attack, uh, some of the attacks, well, IoT devices enable another class of attacks, which I have previously not been exposed to um, too much before I started working at ARM. And those are physical attacks. And um, for those, you often need um, some special hardware, which I show on the, on the, on the right-hand side. And you can do power analysis, um, glitching attacks, um, used to either bypass access control or extract uh, keys in a, in a fairly convenient way, even though the um, crypto techniques are perfectly, uh, perfectly secure by itself. It's the implementation that uh, leads, uh, leaks some, some information. And what is interesting in this environment is that the tools get cheaper and cheaper, and there are lots of tutorials on how to use them, so it's uh, more accessible to a broader audience. And I believe we, see, we will see more and more of those uh, in the future. So the, the, um, the upper one called JTAG later is a tool to connect to different pins on, your, on, on a printed circuit board. And you, the, the, the platform then uh, searches on, and finds out what communication protocol is used uh, and potentially then uh, you can connect to those different um, components to different uh, modules on that board. Very nice uh, tool. The, the lower one is uh, called Chip Whisperer. It's a, it's a platform for doing um, side channel analysis and side channel attacks and glitching attacks, also available for uh, a very good price. Uh, we're talking about $500 here. Um, as, as a remark from, from those attacks, um, I think it's fair to say that uh, many of the Internet of Things security we see today is very much like uh, the, I, uh, the PC security 20 years ago even though many of the attacks today look more like um, the attacks of script, script kiddies, but if you look outside the consumer space into the industrial environment, you, you already see the, the potential or the direction where this is heading. Um, and one example here was an attack last year at a German steel factory where the attackers managed to um, change the, the, the process and um, damage the steel factory. And in another attack in, um, in Poland, a pipeline was uh, blown up, and it was done in such a way that the administrators of that system, who continuously monitor it, uh, only learned about the attack 40 minutes after the attack has actually happened, that the, the pipe, after the pipeline blew up. So it's, um, those are more sophisticated, and you obviously need to understand the, the processes of the factory, so different incentives here. The risk analysis for many of those IoT devices are, is also more complicated because they are not only the direct risks uh, that are probably come to mind to, to most people, but there are also indirect ones, um, like we have seen with uh, DDoS attacks uh, years ago um, against Comcast or uh, using printers where reflection attacks were used uh, in, a, in a massive DDoS attack. Um, moving away from, privacy, uh, from security, I would like to also touch briefly on privacy since we got a lot of comments on, on the privacy side. Um, the IAB publication, RFC 6973, provides good generic guidance, and most, many of it is also applicable to engineering efforts in the idea for these type of protocols. So it's definitely worthwhile to look at those. But IoT uh, poses a couple of other additional challenges, um, and I list two, um, two of them here, like the quality of consent. Many of the devices don't have a user interface, so it's very difficult to um, ask user for consent in a, in a real-time fashion or in a meaningful fashion. Um, there's also a desire of companies to use big data analysis and to collect uh, lots of data from different devices and then correlate those to find new insi uh, interesting insight. And um, doing that uh, obviously raises privacy, privacy concerns for the end users. And there's a, uh, a publication that we reference um, that was timely in, in that sense uh, from one of the European institutions uh, that specifically focuses on, on those aspects, uh, deployment-related aspects. Um, to summarize, so one of the observations that, that we made from the workshops uh, and also from writing the report that we believe that using IETF and, and Internet protocols is, uh, uh, for Internet of Things is, 
is definitely uh, doable and, and is important and saves a lot of uh, problems. The recommendations that we provide are uh, uh, solid and can be, can be used. So those include um, using state-of-the-art key lens, um, using well-analyzed security protocol, use uh, encryption to deal with pervasive monitoring, and also to support automatic key management with all the considerations that go along with it. Um, however, there are some IoT-specific recommendations that I would like to point out that uh, crypto agility is something that is a hard decision uh, and for, for designers and uh, they have to deeply think about it, specifically since many of the algorithms in IoT devices for performance reasons are actually in hardware. So switching from one algorithm to another one is actually not that easy. Um, to also integrate a software update mechanism and leave enough headroom for for these updates. Um, include a random number, hardware-based random number generator in, in the devices, and many of the, the chips that you find out today actually don't have such a uh, random number generator. Uh, when you do the threat analysis, uh, also think about physical attacks, because as I said, uh, they would be more common, and also um, use modern operating system techniques on those devices, since many of them Many of these embedded systems have a very simplistic uh, concept where a single bug in the whole um, software can ruin the entire security. There's no separation of uh, processes and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Hannes and Dave. Um, so now it's time for questions and answers. Um, just to let people know, we are actually using some smart objects for queue management, and we're using light bulbs, of course. They will start out green when you first start asking your question. They will fade to yellow as your time is running out, and then you will get a flash of red, which means it's time to stop talking, okay? So people can be concise, and they'll let everybody have an opportunity to ask their questions. Is, is that enforced with some kind of laser gun? I can't, you, you're, we're not hearing you in the microphone, <laughs> Christian. Pardon me? Oh, this one doesn't work? I, yeah, I don't think that it's on. It's already been hacked. Um, let's go ahead and start over here while you're, yeah. Thank you, Mike Jones, Microsoft. Um, I'm curious, Hannes, Dave, others, where are the ITF's points of leverage in this conversation? I mean, the commercial reality is, is that people will get things in the marketplace and sell them if they appear to work, if they are commercially viable at the moment. And asking people to do things like put an expiration date on your product is just probably not commercially viable. That being said, we have a lot of experience. What conversations are we and should we be having? That, okay. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a uh, very good question, Mike. Um, so you, you see different uh, folks in the community who work in that space providing not only sort of the time to develop specifications, but also writing code, uh, providing open source software. So I hope um, that and there are all sorts of uh, publications that say we, we will have uh, 50 billion of those devices or even more in, in a couple of years that uh, the companies who um, most likely also so many small companies who would then focus their efforts on, on providing some uh, competitive technology rather than spending all their time designing new security mechanisms and internet protocols. So they would just reuse the existing stuff, uh, not only specifications, but also the code that they have. And so hopefully by doing that, they will avoid many of the pitfalls. And so they actually spend their time on, on the things they are good at. Yeah, okay. I'll just add that the leverage is that, uh, that they make decisions based on what's cheapest and most financially profitable for them. So to the extent that we can do the design work for them so they don't have to repeat that, and the fact that we can have a large ecosystem of compatible um, personnel experience tools and so on, then that becomes economically uh, better for them. And so I think that's the indirect tool that we have is rough consensus and running code. Okay. Thanks. Okay, let's move to the back right microphone since Christian was up here at the dud one. Yeah. That one's not working either? Holy moly, that one wasn't working either. I don't think that one's working either. Do we want to grab one? Make sure it's on. No. Oh. 
Oh, there we go. Oh, this works now. Um, Hannes, at some point you said in your uh, presentation you talked about like maybe introducing some kind of a, uh, you know lifetime for devices and, and shelf life. Um, <coughs> so I understand like where, where where this idea would come from, but we you know we have other kind of responsibilities too. I mean, we're talking about billions of devices, and if there's some kind of like uh, uh, program obsolescence for these things, I mean. What's, what's the impact on sustainability uh, in terms of, uh, uh, so not just the, the code, uh, but actually the, the, the resources that, um, uh, you know, if, if we design a world where um, we're going to have even more waste, I mean, I think uh, we're going the wrong direction. So I think there's a balance to strike here. And um, yeah, I would, I would hate to work for her. For an organization, organization that is going to produce more waste, basically. So uh, I think it's a very important thing that you know we need to take into account. And uh, yeah, yeah, um, definitely. So so I didn't come up with the idea to give uh, IoT products a um, sort of time to to live. Um, but uh, those are some of the discussions that you see, for example, in a in a recently published uh, FTC report on Internet of Things. Uh, and it's it's obviously something inspired by uh, uh, Microsoft discontinuing Windows XP, and that has also raised questions because you find us on, uh, on point of sales terminals and, and so on. So um, it's an interesting thing, an interesting question to think about, and, and also the approach that this um, company with the little printer did on, on open sourcing their, their software, which of course may not be a solution for everyone, but it's it's probably hard to make recommendations to companies uh, already up front to tell them, think about what happened if your company went, goes bankrupt. Uh, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky problem. I don't, I don't know how to answer that. OK, thanks. OK, and we're also going to have to freeze the microphone cues right now. So whoever is the last now, that's it. OK, so I'm going to go ahead. Christian, it's your turn. OK, thank you. I'm Christian Ritima from Microsoft. Uh, I have a question for, for Hannes. I mean, uh, I appreciate that you have a privacy slide in your presentation, but I found it a tiny bit sketchy. <laughs> and and when, I, when I see that, yes, you point a real question, which is if we collect all that data, that data ends up in databases that can be used for good and evil, and we have to control that, that's sure. But think of me walking around with my smartwatch and uh, my smart shoes and my smart uh, belt, uh, taking all kinds of measurements <laughs> and sending all kinds of radio messages. I look uh, like a, a green beacon that's going to turn yellow and red, <laughs> and people can track me. That, that's a real problem. Yeah, if, we don't, if we don't find these kind of issues of can you be tracked with those devices when they are moving? Uh, can, they, can they listen to the traffic of those devices? And did you use who's there? I mean, there are all kinds of issues there. that. We are just backfitting into the current TCP IP architecture, and we should think of that from the start with the smart objects. Uh, uh, definitely, and I, I wish I had more time to expand uh, the privacy discussion. Um, as, as you know, it's a very complicated top topic with many facets, uh, and it's it. Yeah. Um, Which is part of. Yeah. yeah so so. Um, <laughs> So I, d I don't know how to satisfactorily answer your question, uh, other than uh, telling you that you are right, uh, there's, there are complicated questions. <laughs> it's a job of the PRIVSEC uh, yeah, program, program that we have, that yeah. Christian is a member of, and we look forward to his contributions. Okay. okay. But, Thank you. But okay, there are, um, obviously, the IETF can't make uh, deployment decisions. So for example, if, uh, in terms of if you think about uh, uh, one of the models that uh, Dave described, where devices talk to the cloud, they obviously uh, more in privacy invasive than, than some others uh, who are very local, uh, but they also provide different features. So um, it will, will be difficult to, uh, to help there. What the IDF could, however, do is to develop uh, technologies that companies could use to enhance the privacy, the privacy of the end users, of the customers, if they wish to do so. Okay, so we're going to move <coughs> over to the left hand queue here. Yes. Uh, Rene Struik. Um, I just had a few things that came up uh, on mostly security issues. So I think one of the uh, main impacts is really on the life cycle. I think if you, if you look at the development of these, these devices, they will have uh, lots of uh, different elements in the chain. And it may be that components change from one manufacturer to the next. They may not trust each other. 
at some moment uh, questions come up is uh, uh, how, when, and where are you doing initial keying? Um, uh, when, where, and also uh, are you going to uh, put an identifier on the device? And when are you going to do binding? I think some of these issues are are not traditionally well addressed in IDF, so I think that's that would be a good one. Um, I also I was happy to see the cost of ownership slide, um, but I also do know that uh, lots of cost, lots of, lots of cost issues come up in uh, technical discussions, where uh, sometimes the tendency is to to water down the f required functionality to meet uh, a cost figure. And uh, just as context, if you deploy uh, an Internet of Things device, and as soon as you have to have a human in the loop, you've already spent more than the cost of the device itself. So I, th I think some of these considerations should really also be uh, tackled more by ITF itself. I still have a little bit of light. Um, the other one is I really like your slide about uh, no trusted platform and physical attacks and so on. I think uh, it's underappreciated that lots of these devices will be out in the open on a garage door accessible to everybody. So physical attacks, implementation attacks. Maybe we can replace some of the trusted platform by um, the network providing that as an alternative. So I think that would be a nice research topic to basically move functionality Time. towards that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, Bernardo Bobo, Microsoft. So uh, thank you for putting together a presentation with a truly terrifying series of attacks. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why things improve is Moore's Law may allow you to do more, more of the things that you would do like in a, in a PC or a large environment. Can you comment on how much you think Moore's Law will be a benefit here or how much it can be exploited? Because I know there are very severe energy constraints. Do you think that, say, 10 years from now, most of the things on your slides will be be fixed. Um, so if I if I find Carsten, he would probably say uh, Moore's, the benefit of Moore's law will be eaten up by uh, by other aspects like uh, energy energy efficiency and so on. But of course we see um, sort of interesting uh, economics at play here because um, simply large volumes of devices. Uh, create new possibilities uh, and large volumes in sectors that actually have nothing to do with another sector actually may spill over and so we see a lot of um, uh, companies providing um, chips that they take from mobile phones where the volumes are massive and then apply them to completely different sectors and you suddenly get um, devices at a, at a ridiculously cheap price uh, and that enables new possibilities so, so we I'll just add that Moore's Law helps attackers too. So a number of the attacks will still be there. Yep. Hi, Phil Hunt Baker. So this morning at about 10 o'clock, uh, my iPhone went off telling me that uh, the smoke detector in my home had, one of them had failed. Uh, a couple of hours ago, I got a phone call uh, from my, the folk back there uh, talking about the interactions with the fire department because apparently the device detected that its uh, sensor had failed and then proceeded to sound the alarm. And, the, and of course, even though you know, this is a one directional thing, it, it'll tell me that the alarm is off, but it won't allow me to turn it off because, you know, users are stupid. But that's not what I really came up for, which is um, my problem is the openness and the stupidity of the business models. In that I've got about 20 light switches that are internet connected. And they, and they come from different vendors because you can't get one that meets all of the needs I have. And the thing is that every one of those vendors has the model of the customer is going to come to us, buy a box from us, and then rent the service back from us. It's kind of like capital cost and razor and blades. And it's kind of like, so I bought this Revolve Hub, okay, so, uh, which was said that I could connect up to all of them and then control them from one platform, which was fine only I could only connect control it from the iPhone but and then that was bought out by a company that bought them out and then shut them down the next day <laughs> so what this is coming to I really need some way of knowing if a device is going to be open or treacherous I would really like to have one ITF protocol 
that I could look for on the box and see. If it supports that protocol, I know that it's something that I'm going to be able to control and put under my system's control rather than being hijacked by a, uh, you know, a razor and blades model and whatever. I'd really like to see that. So that's a good point, yes. Um, w one of the points that I made is yes, but that's not sufficient, meaning that's necessary but not sufficient because the schema issues are still there lurking and even if you solve the common protocol thing on the box, it doesn't mean that you don't have a proprietary schema that's in there that you can actually use. So everything that you said and the problem is even worse. Carrie Lynn, Verizon. Uh, so a couple comments on us. Uh, first, it might be good to socialize in, in a talk like this uh, the vernacular uh, in 7228 so that people know, have a common understanding of what we mean by constrained devices or the classes of those. Um, uh, second, I absolutely uh, agree with your comment that we need to do a secure update because if we get that wrong, everything else is hosed. Um, I like the fact that you called out, for example, that uh, randomness, a good source of, uh, of randomness is something that needs to be built into the hardware. And I would sort of encourage you and others to work on uh, extending that into a min cover set of you know, what potentially needs to go into IoT devices. And I, I imagine that's going to be a moving target. But um, <laughs> And finally, I rage against the dying of the light. <laughs> Michael. Uh, oh, Michael Richardson. No, OK. okay. Does it work? Hi, Michael Richardson. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of things. Thanks to a great, great uh, tech plenary. Um, so the bunch of things I wanted to come in. I was aghast when I think it was actually Dan Greer that said about the stuff that you know IoT devices need to be ha be upgradable or have a, a end of life on them. Mm -hmm. And um, and as Carrie just said, and I was going to say, one of the things we could do and we need to do is we actually need a common secure update protocol. And, you know, I don't know, it might be TFTP over DTLS, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but, but the point is it has to be absolutely so stupid and small that devices can run it even though they don't have the ROM to double buffer, okay? And, and I think that's a major contribution that we could do. The other thing that I finally took home from Dan Greer's talk and other people saying this is that it's the software that has to have an end of life, okay? The device doesn't have to go to a landfill at that point. If it's not field upgradable, it might be store upgradable. You pointed to all the JTAG programmers. So maybe some of the devices, you know, after five years, they stop working or they say they're going to stop working like my... Um, uh, smoke detectors, I'm supposed to change the batteries twice a year, right? Or they complain to me. Um, so maybe that's what they're going to do. They're going to say, please change me now, please change me now. I'm going to stop in six months. I'm going to talk to you or whatever. And uh, you bring them in and that's what they do. And that's how we can avoid the terrible, I think, e-waste story of that. Um, and so again, secure update. I think we got to do it. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Uh, a number of people have said that this week, including at the proposed research group that happened this last weekend. So yep. Definitely. Elliot. Elliot Lear. Uh, to Michael Richardson's point about uh, stupid small update protocols, I'm very confident we can get at least half that done. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say that uh, I just want to thank uh, uh, Hannes and Dave for, for this presentation. Uh, there are a couple of things that I think are worthy of highlight from uh, the combination of the two presentations. Uh, the first is uh, that Hannes put up this requirement, and we've heard a couple of people like Kerry and others uh, talk about uh, the need for uh, random numbers, uh, uh, good random number generators. But the fact is that economics works against that in terms of cost of goods and services. Now, if we couple that with the point that Dave made earlier in his presentation about RFC uh, 1958, I think it is, uh, that talks about uh, the end-to-end -end model, uh, what, we what, what that brings us to is that, in fact, we have a very big challenge in this organization in terms of our own operating assumptions that we need to re consider and decide whether we re revisit the assumptions or if we double down in terms of saying, no, really, smart devices need to have these things. And if so, how are they going to get them in an economically sensible way? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Elliot. Matt Mathis, um, there's also a mechanism to um, force retirement. 
Um, and I'm going to start out by pointing out that um, there's been some recent stories of attacks delivered from home routers and no way to remove these these devices from the market, no, no way to remove them from the, from the field. And it coming up in a security conference that's in fact illegal to scan even to fingerprint devices to discover that, they're, that they've been owned. Um, but in fact, these devices are remotely brickable. And once something reached a threshold of an egregious bug, they should just be bricked. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it should be obligatory for the research community to brick them. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for your attention and your questions and comments. So I'd like uh, Brian and... Um, Andrew to come on up. 